a spontaneous and unrehearsed interview. Hello, and welcome to the 76th episode of Curiosityness. I am Travis DeRose, the host of the show where we interview interesting people and learn about fun stuff. And this episode is no exception. I have on Susan Graney, and she is from English Heritage, which is the organization responsible for keeping Stonehenge safe. So she's an archaeologist, an expert on Stonehenge, and she just shares info about the monuments. So, I mean, if you're like me, you've kind of, you've always heard of Stonehenge, of course, and seen the photos, but never really knew that much about it. Um, And it's not really a mystery at all, as Susan explains, it's a lot of it is really well known and documented. And so this is just a really fun dive into that episode or into Stonehenge and learning about what it all is. And um, especially because as you'll hear too, I'm going in, I'm visiting Stonehenge in a month or so and uh, learning all about this was very fun. So let's get into the episode. If you want to see some of my Stonehenge inner circle visit, you can find me those on Instagram. Uh, I'm on there at curiosityness podcast or me personally at Trav DeRose on Instagram. But that's it. Enough promotion. Let's get to the episode. And here is Susan from English Heritage sharing info about Stonehenge. Hello. What's going on, Susan? How you doing? Hi. How are you? Doing good. Thanks for being on. That's okay. Uh, yeah. I'm like, this is pretty... I'm like, well, I'm excited to talk, first of all, because I'll be coming to uh, London in a little over a month. So we're definitely visiting uh, a Stonehenge. So, you know, oh, cool. yeah, pretty stoked to learn about it. And it's like it's something that it's so famous. Everybody's heard about it, but it's also kind of like I really don't know much about it, you know. Yeah, it's a pretty iconic place. It's a, somewhere that you've seen probably hundreds of photos of. So it's. It's really nice to come and actually see it in where it's set in the landscape and come and learn all about it properly. Yeah. No, no, that's great. Cool. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely excited to come and, and see it for see it in person and everything. We got one of those tours, the uh, I think it's called the Inner Circle Tour also, where we get to walk inside. Oh, have you? Oh, that's cool. That's yeah. really good because um, normally because we have about 1.5 million visitors a year come to Stonehenge, we can't let everybody inside the Stone Circle. So people have to do what you've done, which is book a special access visit, which is kind of before we open in the morning or it's in the evening after we close to the public. And that means you get to go inside in a small group and actually go into the stone circle itself, which is a totally different experience from what our normal visitors get, because you actually get to see the size of the stones up close and you get to look at all the details. And it's much easier to understand the monument from the inside than it is from the outside. Oh, okay. Why is that? Well, it's quite a complicated jumble of rocks, basically. So when you're just walking around the outside of it, it's quite difficult to understand how it kind of fits together. But when you're inside, you realize that there are big stones, which are called the sarsen stones, which are those the ones that we see in the pictures, the ones with the horizontal lintels over the top. Uh, but there are also lots of smaller stones in there called the blue stones. Uh, and they're really interesting to look at because they are a kind of bluey gray color um, and they're quite different and they contrast with the bigger stones. So you can just get a better sense of kind of how it all is laid out inside. OK, kind of being able to walk through it. So yes, can you? Exactly yeah no that's great yeah i'm really excited to go because we were we were kind of on the fence about it because it's a bit of a drive you know coming down from london but um i applied for that tour and they we got accepted so i'm like well we're definitely going now because i'm i'm pretty excited to see it so um, yeah and you'll get to see i mean it's it's set in amazing wiltshire countryside so it's uh kind of rolling open grassland and it's very beautiful so hopefully you'll get good weather and it'll be a real experience for you yeah. Yeah. And we're going, like you said, we're going, I think our tours at like 6 a.m. before you guys open. Oh, so. right. Really early. OK. Yeah. So you might get a sunrise. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, cool. be cool. Yeah. So no. they're in, in, in that area, you tend to get um, really nice sunrises if you get some clear weather. And sometimes you get it where the, the fog or the mist is kind of lying in the valleys and it's just beautiful. So, yeah, mm-hmm. hopefully, fingers crossed, you'll get some nice views. Yeah, right. No, totally. So why is... Why is Stonehenge so famous? Why have we all heard about it? Well, Stonehenge is probably the most famous prehistoric site in the world. 
and it's unique. So it's the only stone circle that we know of in the world that has those horizontal stones, those lintels that connect it together. Um, and it's also the only stone circle in the world where the stones have been worked and shaped by people in prehistory. So we tend to talk to our um, education groups and say it's a bit like Lego in that it has connecting joints. So the stones have been carefully shaped into joints so that they kind of slot together. Um, and that's unique as well. So those two things make it a unique monument, but it also is just a beautiful place. It, it was painted by Turner. It was painted by Constable. It's appeared in so many pictures and photos and adverts. Um, it's just one of those iconic images that's instantly recognisable. And that means that people from all over the world can recognise it and really want to come and visit it, um, which is great. And it's brilliant to be able to use Stonehenge to tell people about prehistory. Uh, but it also puts a lot of pressure on the monument because the monument itself is quite small and quite fragile and we have to try and protect it. So um, we have to kind of balance being able to show off and being really excited about it and tell everyone around it, but also protect it for the future. Right. Yeah, no, I see. Because everyone's like, even if you haven't been there, everyone's seen it because it's just everywhere, especially with social media and stuff. Everyone's sharing that stuff. But um, yeah, yeah I would imagine... some archaeologists here in, in the UK tend to get a bit uh, tired of Stonehenge because it just <laughs> is everywhere. And they get a bit knocked because they want to have their stone circle or their archaeological site uh, in another part of Scotland or Ireland to be just as famous. And there are stone circles all over the British Isles, and there are some equally amazing ones, but somehow Stonehenge is the one that is the most famous. Yeah, right. It's like the, the pop star of henges. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's the other... Stone circle world. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's just super hyped up. Yeah, that's funny. Um <laughs> So there's other, so there's a bunch of other henges and kind of other structures all around um, the UK. But are there are there other like ones that are similar that are made out of stone and kind of look as impressive as Stonehenge does? Um, there are some other stone circles that are just as impressive. They, there's none with those horizontal stones with the lintels, and there's none that have um, this kind of carefully worked and shaped stones. Um, so Stonehenge has uh, got uh, a kind of a friend up in Orkney, which is in the far north of Scotland. It's on an island off the top of Scotland. And that's called the Ring of Brodga, and that's an amazing stone circle, really large. There's um, equally impressive stone circles up on the Outer Hebrides, also in Scotland, called Callanish, which have, when you see photographs of them, they're absolutely stunning, and they're brilliant to go and visit as well. Um, and there are some much bigger stone circles. So Stonehenge is actually quite small. It's very complicated and, and complex, but it's not the biggest by far. So just down the road from Stonehenge is a site called Avebury, and that is a stone circle where there are large, un worked stone set in this enormous circle so big that there is now a modern village in the middle of it so uh, there are other stone circles that kind of trump <laughs> stonehenge but um it is still unique oh, okay wow yeah i didn't realize that that's that's cool it's just it is just kind of the main it's the one that everyone you know it by name and you know the photos of but that would i'd be really curious to eventually go and visit some of these other um you know monuments kind of around the area too yeah they're worth looking into. Um, the the other thing, of course, is that there were lots of other monuments that were built around the same time as Stonehenge that, of course, don't survive today. So Stonehenge is built of stone, and so it survives. And it's also in an area where there's not very intensive development and not very intensive agriculture, so it survives really well. Um, in lots of other parts of the UK, there were timber monuments, just probably just as impressive when they were built. But of course, they're built of wood, and so they've decayed and rotted away. And so they're only known about through excavation or through geophysics or aerial photographs. So in some ways, there would have been probably just as impressive other monuments for people to go and visit if you were living in the Neolithic period. But those are not around to visit today. Right. Yeah. So are these are monuments like this, these kind of found all over the world or is it something that's kind of unique to um, the UK? There are monuments like this all over the world. In fact, I recently went to Japan and the Japanese have stone circles that are built around the same time as Stonehenge. They're not as impressive. They are much more like kind of big circular stone settings. Um, so the tallest standing stones are only about kind of uh, waist high. They're not, you know, above your head. Um, but they have stone circles and those stone circles are also aligned with the sun. 
as Stonehenge is, as I'm sure we'll come on to. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, Korea has uh, similar tombs, stone megalithic tombs. Some parts of the world still have communities who, uh, what we call kind of living megalithic communities. So they still build standing stones um, and stone circles uh, in places like northern India and in parts of Madagascar. So, um, yeah, all over the world, different communities at different times have built such structures. But I don't think there's one quite as complex or as kind of unique as Stonehenge's. Wow. I didn't realize it was it was kind of they're still kind of even building or they're still, still being built today. Even that's crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah, some of the, the communities that build today tend to be just raising individual standing stones, still kind of massive stones and still really impressive. Um, but there aren't too many that are kind of building really enormous monuments. Um, so like you get in Southern America, in the Mississippi Delta, there are some really enormous mounds and earthwork enclosures. And uh, we have those two in the British Isles. But as far as I know, there's no living communities that build those kind of monuments anymore. Uh, OK, I see. So, yeah. I, I mean, like, kind of the natural question is, like, wh why? Why are all these <laughs> being built? You know, are they interconnected? Like, why was Stonehenge built, you know? So... The, the kind of line that we tend to trot out, so I, I work um, for English Heritage, who are the charity that look after Stonehenge. So I am involved in what we call visitor interpretation, exhibitions, guidebooks. And so we have to come up with ways of describing, you know, why was Stonehenge built? And the way we did it for the visitor centre that we have there now is it says it's a prehistoric temple aligned with the movements of the sun. Now, that doesn't tell you why they built it, but it sort of gives you a sense of the key points of it, that it's a temple, as in it's a religious or ritual building, and um, it's aligned with the movements of the sun. And, and at Stonehenge, although the site's been excavated um, quite a number of times over the last hundred years or so, and we know quite a lot about it, we know quite a lot about exactly when it was built and how it was built, we don't really know exactly how it was used. And obviously getting back to the belief systems of people who lived four and a half thousand years ago is pretty tricky. So at Stonehenge, it's kind of annoying because the people in prehistory just kept it really clean. They didn't leave <laughs> kind of nice feasting debris around with lots of animal bones and smashed pots. There wasn't lots of burning evidence. It's kind of clean, like, like maybe if you excavated a church, it might be quite clean. Mm -hmm. So... Um, for that reason, we have to kind of rely on the stones themselves. So the way the stones are laid out and the way that the, um, uh, the architects of the monument seem to have arranged the site. And one of the key things about that is that the stones are arranged to reflect, basically to frame the movements of the sun. So the monument lines up with the sunrise on the longest day of the year in midsummer and also the sunset on the shortest day of the year in midwinter. And that's yeah. a pretty cool feat. I mean, just to build such a complicated monument and make it that accurate is quite astonishing. But it tells us that the sun and the movements of the sun, the changing seasons, time, whatever it was, was quite crucial to their religious beliefs. Um, and so we can kind of hazard a guess that people were gathering there at those times, that maybe they conducted rituals there that were to do with kind of making sure the sun came back, uh, making sure the sun came back after the longest night, for example. Um, maybe, and that's to do with kind of fertility and agriculture and the seasons and things. But that's pretty much as far as we can get with kind of trying to guess what the beliefs of the people were that built it. Right. Yeah. No, I can imagine that'd be like kind of frustrating, almost like eternally frustrating because you never are going to have like a, a solid answer. It's just making the best guesses you can with what you guys are able to find there. Yeah, it is. Although the good thing about archaeology is there's always new techniques and there's always new research going on. Um, so in the last um, 10 years, uh, well, no, about 15 now, it was found initially in 2006, um, there's been some excavations about a mile and a half away from Stonehenge at a site called Durrington Walls. And those excavations have uncovered a settlement that was occupied at the time that they were building Stonehenge. So that's new, all new information. So we've got loads of information about the houses that they were living in, the food they were eating, where the food was coming from, kind of pots they were using. So actually, even though kind of it it's always feels a bit frustrating we're kind of piecing together tiny bits of the puzzle all the time oh ah, okay so this would have was this like uh, probably the where all the builders of stonehenge were living while it was being constructed 
Yeah, that's one interpretation. So the radiocarbon dates that have come back from the site give pretty much exactly the same date as when the sarsen stones are being constructed at Stonehenge. So we think it's where the builders of Stonehenge either lived or it's where people were gathering just after, as in the people who were using Stonehenge. So it looks like a place where lots of people were gathering, uh, lots of feasting was going on, um, and potentially those people were travelling from quite some distance to get to that place and to come and celebrate at Stonehenge. So um, it's kind of like a gathering place. It's not a permanent settlement. Um, it seems to have been used for about 50 to 100 years, so quite a short-term settlement. Um, so, yeah, we think it's connected with the building and use of Stonehenge. Uh, okay, I see. So... Is like our, all, for all the other kind of monuments around the area, is it kind of a similar thought that they were just used for kind of religious or spiritual stuff? Yeah. So um, Stonehenge is um, pretty unusual in that it has this alignment with the sun. Most other stone circles and earthwork monuments and timber monuments don't have such clear um, patterns that show us that the sun was important. There's, there's lots of kind of archaeologists that would claim that the moon is important at some and, you know, debates are held. But basically Stonehenge is the only one where the, the, there's this really clear relationship. So they're, they're also built for other things, these stone circles and these henges. They're gathering places, they're places where people would carry out ceremonies, they're places of ritual and religion. But also this place, this settlement place, this Durrington Walls that was excavated, was then enclosed within a henge. Later, when the when the settlement was abandoned, they built an enormous earthwork around the edge of it. So sometimes henges could be used for henges kind of enclosed a space rather than being something particular. So um, yeah, so there were lots of different uses for these monuments, but the key one is always kind of ritual and religious beliefs and activities. Uh, okay, so it was... oh, sorry that may not make much sense. So um, I'll just explain the henge bit. So Stonehenge, the name. The henge bit is from the Saxon, which means hanging, so that the name is hanging stones, Stanhenge, hanging stones. Oh. But the henge bit, the word henge has been used by archaeologists to describe the earthwork, circular earthwork, basically a bank and a ditch that encloses the stone circle. And you don't really notice it in most photographs of Stonehenge, but that's what we call a henge. And then the word henge has been applied to circular earthworks all over the rest of the British Isles. Sometimes they enclose stone circles, sometimes they enclose timber circles, sometimes they enclose settlements. So there's a whole range of things going on at Henges. But, yeah, that's a bit confusing. But <laughs> OK, no, I, I think I get it. So it's kind of like so the stones were built, you know, that whole monument that we always see in the photos were kind of built first. And then secondarily around it was what is called the Henge, which is just kind of like earthwork, like you said. Yes, exactly. Except, confusingly, at Stonehenge, the henge came first. So the earthwork around the edge was built in around 3000 BC, about 5000 years ago. And the stones were put up in the middle about 500 years later, in about 2500 BC. Uh, so there's a quite a long gap between the two of them. Interesting. Um, yeah, so we, that first monument is really interesting because it was used as a cremation cemetery. So it was used as a place where people were bringing their dead as kind of little bags of ashes, and they were burying their dead in uh, pits and in the ditch and the bank of this henge monument. So the earliest part of Stonehenge is a, is a, is a sort of basically a cemetery. Um, and then later on, they build the stones that are aligned with the sun. Wow. Okay. So the but the the first hinge in, that wasn't aligned with the the solstice or anything. Mm, well, the entrance, um, so the the kind of causeway into the hinge was aligned towards the northeast, which is where the summer sunrise is. But it wasn't. It was more of a general orientation. It it didn't have this precise um, alignment with the sunrise and sunset. Okay. Okay. So it may have been involved, but but maybe not. Also. Yeah, it's a bit difficult to tell at that early date whether it's just fortuitous or whether they deliberately built it like that. Okay. And then do, what do we know about the the people that were cremated and buried there? Oh, well, really interesting. So um, 
when the site was dug in the 1920s, they dug up all these cremations. And at the time in archaeology, basically people didn't really know what to do with a cremation because they didn't know how to look at them. If you had a full skeleton, you can, you know, measure the long bones and estimate how tall the person was. And you can look and see if it's a male or a female and how old they are and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Cremations are just tiny bits of broken bone. And so what the archaeologists did in the 1920s was rebury all of the cremations that they found in one hole on the site because they literally they were kind of like well this is useless stuff but let's put it back <laughs> so <Jeez>. in <laughs> in 2008 um some archaeologists said well come on let's go back now we've got all these techniques we can we're very much better at looking at tiny bits of bone we can use dna studies we can look at isotopes we can really carbon date so they went back and they re-excavated this hole that they'd all been dumped into and a PhD student in London has been painstakingly going through and looking at all of these bones. So we now know that there's kind of, um, I think, 65 confirmed individuals in, in that collection. Only about half of Stonehenge has been excavated, remember. So there might be more people than that buried at the site. Mm-hmm. And they were men and women and children. So it's not like they were just, you know, elite um, leaders necessarily that were, were buried there. Um, they were a range of ages and they seem to have come from a range of places. So there's something called um, stable isotope analysis, which can be done on bones and teeth, which basically allows you to look at the type of geology that the person who is buried there, where they were living when they grew up, basically. So it shows that some of these people were born um, quite far afield, so some in, into Wales and in other parts of, this, of southern England. So potentially people are kind of bringing their dead to Stonehenge over quite some distances. Okay, and but we... So it's kind of like inconclusive or not really known like who these people were then if it's just kind of if it's there's not really a a similarity between all these different individuals. No, there's nothing like that. And yeah, you're right. We don't really know that much at the moment about exactly who they are. Um, Detailed DNA work, I'm not sure has been done yet on those remains, Um, but it's quite unusual to find any burials from that particular period. So you know, in the British Isles as a whole, we, we have probably have a handful of, of people who are buried. So they must be doing something else with all the other people that die. Um, they must be doing something like cremating them and putting the ashes into a river or something else that basically means that the, the bodies don't turn up archaeologically. So maybe these people are special in some way, but why those particular people got chosen, who knows? It's your guess is as good as mine. Right. OK. Wow. So, but there may be some more, it's still being studied. So there may be some more information. It's still being studied. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to a conference in a couple of weeks that has a paper about those cremations being presented at it. So I shall learn more. (laughs) Right. Oh man, that's cool. That's so exciting when new stuff is still coming out like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's, so that was kind of built first, that first earthwork hinge. And then, and then they just decide, do we know why the stones begin to be placed in the middle? No. So the stones get put up in around 2500 BC, and that's a date when there's a lot of monuments being built in the British Isles. There seems to be this kind of slightly mad explosion of people building wacky monuments. (laughs) So... Uh, They're building really complicated stone circles like Stonehenge. They're building really massive stone circles like Avebury and the Ring of Brodgar up in Orkney. And they are building really big monuments. So there's a near Avebury is a a big mound, an artificial mound called Silbury Hill, which is the largest artificial mound in Europe. And they're building that also at that time. So it's part of a kind of uh, fashion, if you like, for building wacky things. Um, And some people have suggested that it's almost like different communities were trying to outdo each other in how big or elaborate or complicated the monuments were that they were building. Right. Um, But that particular date, 2500 BC, is a really crucial date in prehistory because it's just at the cusp of when when, um, new metals are coming over from continental Europe into the British Isles. So at that time, basically you're talking about the end of the Stone Age, so the end of the Neolithic period, and we're just about to start the early Bronze Age, which is when you get the copper and the gold and the first bronze, and 
at that point, everything changes. So you get a new style of burial rite where people are buried in single graves with grave goods. You get a new type of uh, material. This metal comes in for the first time. You get a new type of pottery, something called beaker pottery. And so there's some ideas that this kind of like big explosion of mad building happens because there's this big change coming on the horizon. And in Europe, on continental Europe at that time, they've been using metal for quite a long time. And they've been quite happily using beaker pots and having a nice life. While in the British Isles, we are quite different. Um, and so there's a quite recent studies in DNA particularly have shown that there's quite a big influx of new people, new population comes into the British Isles just at that point. Um, so that's pro we have to look to that really complicated bit of prehistory to understand why they're building these big monuments, including Stonehenge. OK, so OK, I see. So it, all this new stuff is kind of coming out. But why would I mean, what ha in what ways does that kind of theorize that that would affect these new, you know, new technology and things like that of them building, you know, a big stone circle? Well, there's two ways of thinking about it, or at least I think there's two ways of thinking about it. One is that it's a threat. You've basically got a whole new system, new, probably new language, religion, belief system, whatever, coming in. Um, and you kind of double down and do what you do better and bigger and more elaborate. So if you're building stone circles in order to appease the gods or in order to provide the most impressive monument you can for your community, you're going to do that bigger and better because there's this kind of threat on the horizon. So that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that... Um, building all of these monuments got a little bit mad and the people kind of outdid themselves to the point where people started going, hang on, I'm not building another monument again. This is ridiculous. I just want to go and spend some time with my family and not have to be lugging large stones around and breaking my back, you know, doing <laughs> your ridiculous commands. So maybe there's, there's something of a bit of a breakdown in society because they overreach themselves with their construction projects. And that kind of collapse or that kind of rebellion whatever happens means there's a bit of a power vacuum and that allows the people from the continent to come in for the first time uh kind of unchallenged and sort of change things so yeah that, that those are that, that i would say those are my two ideas about what's happening at that time okay um, no, but, I, this is all quite speculative it's all quite guesswork <laughs> right no no i totally understand and that's kind of what this a lot of this revolves around but that that makes a lot of sense susan i mean like we're still sort of we still do that today even where you know i don't remember what it was but they're building two skyscrapers and then at the last minute they stick on an extra little pointy thing at the top so it's considered the tallest one in the world you know what i mean yeah yeah, exactly. Exactly. So some people think that it's kind of competition. So that you're kind of saying, well, I'll build mm, this really complicated stone circle called Stonehenge. And then the people kind of 20 miles away say, well, in that case, we're going to build the biggest mound you've ever seen in your life. Um, <laughs> and these monuments would have been pretty astonishing for the people living in the British. They wouldn't have seen necessarily anything like this before. So you can imagine them becoming kind of like tourist attractions, but not, you know, places where people are like, well, have you seen it? Have you seen what they're doing down south? They're building the most ridiculous thing. OK, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> um, <laughs> but but there's a little bit of an issue with that in that it presupposes that people are basically living in the area around the monuments and kind of building their local monuments. And the picture we get from isotope evidence and from DNA is that people are maybe moving around quite a lot. So there might not be kind of static communities living in one place. One of the problems we have with this period of prehistory and a lot of prehistory in the British Isles is we don't really know where people are living most of the time. Um, the settlement at Durrington is really unusual, um, that one that was found that's near Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really exciting when we found it because it was one of the first Neolithic monument, uh, Neolithic settlements that we've kind of ever found. So... We, are, we, we assume that people are living quite mobile lifestyles. They're maybe not necessarily living in kind of permanent houses or permanent settlements. Either that or we haven't found them yet. Um, so there's a bit of a big knowledge gap about exactly where people were living um, and what, they, were they, what kind of communities that they were living in at this time. Right. OK, I see. Because it's, yeah, it'd be a, I mean, it'd be a kind of strange or I guess trying to figure out maybe why some people would be motivated to build such a large structure and then kind of just leave it, you know, if it wasn't part of their permanent home, I guess. 
Yeah, yeah, and and, it, and you're right in thinking that you know, this was a massive effort. The stones themselves were transported from uh, some distance away. So the large stones come from kind of 20 miles away, we think. Um, and the small stones, the blue stones, when I say small, they're still kind of two or three tonnes, were brought from South Wales, so kind of 250 kilometres away. So there's an enormous amount of effort going in just to bring the stones to the site. Then you've got to shape the stones, work the stones, which must have been pretty backbreaking. They're just using hammer stones and things to shape the stones. And then you've got to actually put the stones upright and get it accurate and get all the stones in the right place and put the lintels up on top using scaffolding and levers and stuff. And you've got to have all the people providing food for all the workers. And you've got to have people looking after the kids and building the houses and, you know, making sure that they had enough equipment, like ropes and antler picks and things. So the whole thing is it it's a massive logistical kind of achievement. Um, so we have to think of it as being a bit like, I don't know, like an, like an Olympic village that's being built and there's the kind of construction camp and all of the logistics that go with it. So, yeah, it's it's one of those things. How do you persuade that many people to put that much effort into something you know were they slaves or did they do it kind of out of their own free will um Mm. i quite like to think of it as being a bit like a bit like going to mecca or something in that you would basically be living in your community but you would go and give you know two or three months of your life to help with the big building project and then you would go home again maybe Mm, okay yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because, man, how would you motivate? It would be a tough sell to motivate someone to work that hard on something without there has to be a really good motivation. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think in my mind it can be just that somebody was in power and told them to do so, because I think you'd just be like, well, in that case, I'm off. You know, yeah. there's plenty of space for you to kind of go and find somewhere else to live. Or Right. Yeah. Um, so I, can't, I can't think it has to do with belief and religion and I think the people that I don't like to think of it as being slaves. I mean, the, the kind of parallel for this is the ancient Egyptian pyramids, where for many years people thought it was slaves that built them. But um, we now know from hieroglyphics and from paintings and things in the tombs that it wasn't slaves at all. So I kind of I'd like to think that the people were doing it because they wanted to. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, is is it possible that it could have just been, you know, similar today where it's they're just hired workers like it's kind of a a community project or something like that? Yeah, it could be. Yeah. If you were provided with plenty of food and accommodation could could be. We know that they were feasting on kind of large amounts of meat, particularly pig, particularly pork um, at the time. So they, they were certainly rewarded. Or, um, and, and maybe the evidence from Darrington Wall suggests kind of feasting on a massive scale. So, you know, they're having quite a fun time. Um, they're having a bit of a party. So maybe, you know, it's just quite an amazing festival that you go to and help out with a project while you're there. Right. Yeah. It's just a labor of love and a big party. Yeah. That could be <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Man, it's kind of fun to just kind of theorize on what it could possibly be. Yeah, yeah. It's kept people busy and thinking for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, you know, 2500 BC, this like the people who built this were essentially the same. They're essentially humans today. Like they're the same people. And, you know, they weren't. They they were sophisticated. um, And mm -hmm. so we think. The people who built Stonehenge were, well, we know that they were farmers. They could grow crops. They kept domestic animals, cattle and pigs. Um, A lot of the things that they did would have been quite familiar to us today. But they definitely had, and this goes for the whole of the Neolithic, really, a particular way of understanding the landscape and the resources that were available to them so that they lived, you know, obviously fairly plentiful lives at times so you know if you dumped me in the middle of Wiltshire and told me to fend for myself um I'd probably last about 24 hours so these people knew you know which animals they could hunt how to look after their herds of cattle which trees were going to be good for nuts at what time of year what plants would be good for medicine or other purposes you know all kinds of things they could make clothing out of uh, nettle fibers and linen uh, they were very used to leather working um, you know they just had a, a huge range of skills that 
you know, we go and learn on kind of bushcraft weekends or whatever, but we never really have to put them to the test. Um, So I always like to think that people at that time were actually a bit more sophisticated than us in that um, they they knew how to survive and they knew their landscape and they knew kind of their way around. Um, And those are skills that we could probably do with learning now <laughs> <laughs> right yeah no they were they were definitely adept at their uh their environment knew how to navigate and stuff that we just don't have to yeah. today we just don't yeah. even encounter that kind of stuff yeah yeah and and the kind of they must have had really complicated um religious beliefs they must have had complicated relationships and rituals and things and um yeah it would be quite fun to be able to jump in a time machine and go back and find out exactly how what they actually thought but i don't think that's going to happen <laughs> right yeah <laughs> well that's a, it like i think feel like it's almost a misconception that people think uh you know that it, this had to have been built by aliens or something because how would they have moved stones like there's no way they could have figured that out but they they were very resourceful and and intelligent yeah definitely and and it although moving stones down i mean it's it sounds complicated, but it's not ridiculously complicated. It just involves a lot of coordination and good communication and, you know, skill of some sort and, and strength. But it just ha- is it's sort of also imagination and kind of persuading people to do something like that. Um, I think it's quite a uh, it's quite a good indication of kind of how how they could work together as a community to to achieve things. Right. Okay. So let's talk about how the like where the stones came from because they um particularly they they came from they had to transport them a long ways away correct yeah yeah so the sarsen stones which are the really big stones they're the ones that you see in all the iconic pictures of stonehenge um come from well we actually don't know exactly where the sarsen stones came from the most regularly quoted site is about 20 miles to the north of Stonehenge in an area called the Marlborough Downs and that's where the Avebury Stone Circle is the really big one Mm -hmm. and that uh, is also built of sarsen stones so sarsen is a kind of stone that basically is a it outcrops across kind of chalk areas of southern England Um, and we don't actually know exactly where it's from. There are natural scatters of sars and stones in that area still today, but none of them are as big as the ones that you find at Stonehenge. Um, so um, there's actually a really exciting project happening at the moment where um, I'll tell you the full story in a minute, but basically there's a piece of Stonehenge which is being analysed by some really specialist geologists down at the University of Brighton. And they've been basically sampling sars and stones from across southern England, and they're hoping to pin down um, exactly where the sarsens that built Stonehenge came from. So hopefully, fingers crossed, in kind of, I don't know, six months or a year's time, we might know a little bit more about which sarsens were used. Oh, OK. Is it kind of thought that they all came from the general area or were the, was there like a lot of searching to try to find large enough stones? Well, that's that's what's the bit of a mystery is that where they outcrop in kind of natural formations now, there are no big stones the same size as the ones at Stonehenge. So either they took all the big ones or <laughs> maybe they're from another location. So um, they might be from... Um, somewhere we haven't guessed at yet, or they might just be from um, another place. Last year, quite surprisingly, we uh, had a contact from a guy who said, I think I've got a bit of Stonehenge. And this was a bit of a surprise to us because we didn't know that there were any any bits of Stonehenge kind of outside of the main museums that we already know about. Right. Uh, This guy said, well, my dad was um, somebody who worked at Stonehenge in the 1950s when they were doing some quite major restoration projects. So in the 1950s, they put some of the stones back upright and that kind of thing. And his father worked for a laser cutting company who were commissioned to drill out uh, some holes in one of the stones that they were putting upright because they needed to pin it together because it had a big crack through it. Mm. And he'd uh, been so proud of this project that he basically kept the core, as in this kind of meter long piece of stone drilled out from one of the middle uh, middle of one of the Stonehenge stones, and he'd hung it in his office in the company where where he lived, where he worked. And when he retired in the seventies, he'd taken this core with him to America, where he'd retired. And he'd taken it with him. He'd lived in several places in America and ended up eventually in Florida. Um, And when he was in his 90s, he decided that really he ought to return this bit of Stonehenge to 
us to the UK and to Stonehenge. So his son got in touch with us at English Heritage and said, would you like this piece of Stonehenge back? (laughs) So this was great because we were amazed that this piece existed. We'd had no idea these cores had been kept. Um, There's great stories about kind of him um, keeping it and the work that was done at the time. So we said, yes, please, we'd like it back. So there was a packing case made and sent across to America and it came back. Uh, with one of his sons. Um, And that piece of stone is really useful for us because not only do we know it's a piece of sarsen stone from Stonehenge, but we know exactly which stone it's from. And so the geologists who were already doing um, quite a big project to try and look at all the sarsen stones in southern England and work out where the Stonehenge stones had come from said, this is amazing. Please, can we have a really small piece of this sarsen core so that we can do some destructive um, geological analysis? So basically, they're looking at the very kind of microscopic makeup and chemical um, composition of the sarsen. And hopefully, fingers crossed, they'll be able to match that to the data that they have from sarsen. Sarsen, um, uh, natural sarsen outcrops across southern England. So that piece of core coming back from America is hopefully going to help us understand a little bit more about where the stones at Stonehenge come from. Okay, I see. Oh man, that's cool that that'll, that'll be able to match up that way. Yeah, yeah. So the other stones at Stonehenge are the blue stones, which are these much smaller ones. And those are the ones that were transported from southwest Wales. So that's about 250 kilometers away. Um, about 100 and 160 miles, something like that. Um, and they come from a place called the Preseli Hills, which are a range of kind of rocky hills. Um, and they are a kind of distinctive blue-gray color. And in the 1920s, a geologist um, I managed to identify the stone as coming from these Preseli Hills. But in recent years, um, geologists have actually managed to identify the specific outcrops from where some the different stones came from. So we know pretty much exactly where those stones come from. And also in the last few years, some excavations have been taking place to identify the quarry sites. Um, so these stones are kind of pillars and they kind of, they, they naturally occur as quite pillar-like stones. So basically all the people were doing in prehistory was kind of prizing them off and, and transporting them down the hill. Um, but there is evidence from those quarries of hammer stones and wedges and things that show that they were being worked in the Neolithic. Um, so that's really exciting. So we know that they were um, acquiring the stones and bringing them all the way to Stonehenge um, at that time. Wow, that's so cool. And then so is it is there any... Um... I don't know, like uh, remains that have been found or anything like that to kind of show evidence of how they move these stones? Mm, Yeah, at the quarry sites, they've they've found kind of how the stones have been propped up. But um, basically, we don't have any evidence of how the stones were moved. It's likely that they were using kind of timber um, sledges or some sort of timber structure to actually um, uh, attach ropes to and kind of drag the stones. Um, Lots of people have done various experiments over the years to try and work out uh, was it rollers or was it, um, you know, some form of sledge or a trackway? The ones from Wales, um, probably most of the distance was over water, so they could use boats or rafts, uh, probably quite what we would think of as relatively sophisticated boats, um, to to basically transport them along the south coast of Wales and up the Bristol Channel, up the rivers to Stonehenge. But they would have still had to drag them over land for the last little bit. Yeah, I'd Um, imagine you need a pretty sophisticated or large boat to make a, a rock float. Yeah, and kind of annoyingly, the the earliest really sophisticated boats we have are from a little bit later than Stonehenge, the ones that actually survive. Um, There's some kind of well-preserved timber boats that survive from around the coast of the UK from about 2000 BC onwards. But what technology they had at that date, we don't actually know. Um, Because, of course, the boats and the rollers and the ropes and everything are made of things that degrade and don't survive. So we don't have exact evidence as to how they were brought but they definitely were so <laughs> must have been pretty sophisticated mm-hmm. yeah i mean well it's, it was obviously like definitely possible to move these stones it's not like it was an impossible feat where and i, I feel like that's the when people start pointing to aliens and other weird stuff like that but it, it the again like they were sophisticated people who could figure this out yeah, definitely. They were they were just as clever as you and me, so they, they could definitely do it. And they had a, a, probably quite a long time to think about it. They weren't distracted by TV or... <laughs> <laughs> or podcasts, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, wow. I mean, yeah, there, there were, um, I mean, the kind of aliens thing is always, I would think it's slightly insulting to the, to the people at the time to think that, oh, well, humans could never have been clever enough to have done this. It must have been someone from another planet. Like, well, no. No, that they, it was them. They were that good. <laughs> right. Yeah, they were that good. Yeah. So, and then you you kind of alluded to this, but what was um, you said it had to be rebuilt a little bit? But what was kind of, I guess, when Stonehenge was kind of completed, you know, the the stone part with the lentils and all that kind of stuff. What did it? How did it look then compared to now? If if we know that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, when it was completed, um, and there were several stages and there was a bit of moving around of stones, but let's ignore that for now. Um, there was a complete ring of 30 upright sarsens, so 30 upright stones, and they were connected by 30 horizontal lintels, so a complete ring of, of stone. And then within that were five what we call trilithons, which just means three stones, so two uprights and a ho- joined by a horizontal one. So five trilithons in, in a little horseshoe. And then the blue stones were in a- arrangements in amongst those sarsens. So some archaeologists don't think that Stonehenge was ever completed because there's so much stone now missing from the site. There's quite a lot of stone missing from particularly from what I call the back of Stonehenge, which is the bit a- away from where the main entrance was. Um, but there, so, and, and so many of the stones are fallen. Um, we don't know when most of the stones fell. Um, we have a plan of the site from 1740, which shows the site pretty much as it looks today. So most of the stones fell over or were removed before that date. Um, one of the sets of one of the trilithons fell over in 1797, and that was recorded. And that one was put back upright in 1958 in one of the kind of restoration programs. Um, in general, the work that was done to Stonehenge was to try and keep it safe and keep visitors safe and make sure stones that didn't fall on their heads. Um, but <laughs> towards the end of the project, they um, did do some work that they with the aim of making the monument more understandable. So putting back things that, that they knew where that they had stood before. So because we had this accurate plan from 1740, they were able to, to restore some of it. But um, sometimes say, oh, why don't you restore the, wet, the rest of it? Well, A, most of the stone is missing. B, the stones that are there on site are sometimes broken into two or three different parts. Mm. See, quite a lot of the stones on the ground are quite eroded. Um, they've been sat on and people have chipped bits off them and they've had their picnics on them and things for hundreds of years. So they're, they're not going to look the same if we put them back upright. But also part of the appeal of Stonehenge is that it's a ruin. It's a ruin that was painted by Turner. It's a ruin that was painted by Constable. If we if we kind of over-restore it, it kind of loses that aspect. Yeah. So um, the, nothing's been done since 1964. 1964 was the last piece of restoration work that was done at Stonehenge. Um, and they did a pretty good job because we haven't had to do anything with the site since in terms of major restoration work. Right. And and then so if, you know, if it was completed, if Stonehenge was completed, you know, in 2500 BC or, or whenever, mm-hmm. and now some of the stones are missing, where so they would have had to drag those off and, and move them somewhere else? Or do you have yeah. an idea? Is yeah, we don't. Uh, annoyingly, at Avebury Stone Circle, we have some really good records um, from the kind of 16th, 17th centuries of people um, deliberately knocking the stones over, breaking them up using fire, and then using them to build um, uh, cottages and pubs and churches oh, and things. Okay. So the stone was reused. So uh, if you go to Avebury Village, the village itself um, is basically built of the Sarsen stone from the, the Stone Circle. Wow. But uh, Stonehenge, there isn't really a, a settlement very close by. And there isn't that many historic buildings that have got sarsen stone used in them. So we think that most of the stone was broken up and used for road stone. Um, so used to basically pave um, the kind of big turnpike roads that crossed the Salisbury Plain at the time. Oh, wow. Um, it is a little bit of a mystery where where it's all gone. Um, but our best guess is that kind of in the medieval and later medieval and, and up until kind of probably the 18th century, people were just removing bits of the stone to use um, in nearby building projects and or to make roads. Okay. Yeah, I know that that's, that's a, that makes sense. I was because I was curious, like what they would have done with such a large stone. Um, and then yeah. so is there yeah. any like was there any evidence of the like them putting like a finish or a paint on the stones or anything to kind of beautify them? 
No, they they are kind of when I say kind of worked and shaped what they were doing to the stones was using kind of large round other bits of sarsen to kind of bash away at the surface of the stones to kind of shape them into rectangular and kind of regular shapes. And that process basically took off the outside weathered bit of the sarsen, which is kind of grey, and exposed the kind of whitish grey colour. So when it was first constructed, it would have been quite a bright white. It's now very grey looking, partly because it stood there for so long, but also because it's covered in lichen and all kinds of other stuff. Um, so initially, the stones, when they were worked and shaped, they were they were kind of making them look quite bright and quite white, which would have contrasted with the blue stones, which when you freshly work a blue stone, it's a, it's a dark blue-grey colour, and a lot of the, the blue stones have kind of white spots in them, which is quartz. Um, so the two types of stones would have looked a lot more contrasting in their colours than they are now. Oh, OK. Wow, that would have been quite cool to see. But um, no paint, right, and no evidence of kind of colour or anything like that. There are some carvings that were added to the stones after Stonehenge was built in the early Bronze Age. Um, uh, you'll see those if you go and visit, but um, they're a bit later. Oh, OK. And then... How how do you think they were able to to lift up and put up those lentils on top? That just seems like incredibly impressive to be able to pull off that. Yeah, it is. I mean, they must have used um, timber scaffolding. So basically just levering up the stone inch by inch and inserting kind of um, planks or logs underneath to get it up to the right height. What they then did seem to have done is that the tops, so they've got something called mortise and tenon joints. So there's basically a, um, a little knob that sticks up on top of the stone and it goes into a hollow on, on the underside of the lintel. Oh. And what they were doing was kind of basically getting that accurate fit while the stone was up there on the scaffolding. So they seem to have made a kind of oval shape that was then kind of shaped down into a circular um, fitting. So they were not only just raising the stones up, but they were kind of precariously hanging around up there and bashing bits of rock off in order to make them fit together really snugly. So, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's quite astonishing, really. I think, I don't know, I guess they didn't have quite the same health and safety rules we had today, but I can't imagine um, somebody and some other people didn't get injured or have squashed fingers or whatever from the process. Yeah. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? <laughs> what, a, what a process. Yeah. <laughs> Getting your, so I'm, there's got to be a finger squished in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Man, well, this is so interesting, Susan. Um, so real quick, I, we'll kind of wrap it up here. Thank you so much. We've okay. been talking for a while. I really appreciate it. Okay. But um, tell me about some of the, uh, the people who have come to visit and that you've kind of showed around the area. Okay, so my uh, I, I've worked for English Heritage for 15 years now, um, and I've worked specifically with Stonehenge since 2009. Um, so 10 years, amazingly. Um, and mm -hmm. because I tend to be the person that gives the the tours of stone circles to special visitors, and because I, I tend to be spokesperson for the site, um, I get to meet all the exciting people that come visit us, uh, including. Um, Quite surprisingly, a few years ago, Barack Obama turned up. Um, so that was he was probably my most exciting visitor. Um, he was over in the UK for um, a, 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 a NATO. Oh no, it was a, a G. A, one of the big kind of international summits that was happening in um, in Newport in South Wales. Mm -hmm. And apparently, he had said that he, he, if he got any spare time, he would really like to visit Stonehenge. Um, so we um, uh, managed to facilitate a visit for him, and uh, it was probably one of the most bizarre experiences of my life because we were there to meet him, and he had been flown in on Air Force One, and then they had this kind of um, convoy of cars, um, and the guy with the phone, and they came to install the presidential phone line and all kinds of exciting things. Um, <laughs> um, and anyway, he was great. He jumped out the car and was amazingly smiley. And he was very happy because he'd just been in this conference room with no windows for days on end, having to discuss deep international problems. Mm -hmm. So he said it was such a tonic to come and visit Stonehenge. So we showed him around the site um, uh, and he loved it and asked loads of really, really good questions just as you have done. And um, uh, and then he left again. And then as soon as he left, all these, we hadn't realized, but there was lots of security had been kind of hiding. Not really, there's not really anywhere to hide at Stonehenge, but suddenly, you know, various snipers and things popped up from behind <laughs> ground barrows and things. Um, and yeah, it was just quite bizarre, but it was very special to show him around and he, he, he really enjoyed it. So that was nice. Wow, man. Very cool. 
Yeah, so he he was my most exciting visitor. Um, I have also met Buzz Aldrin, uh, who came to visit us when he was doing his Mars mission promotion. Um, and we took him into the center of the stone circle and he turned to me and he said, so where do you keep the aliens? And <laughs> <laughs> I had to say, oh, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> so, uh, so that was fun. He was really, he was really nice. He kind of enjoyed it. And then uh, we have, I mean, we have had visits from, you know, British royalty and things when they come and open various bits of visitor centre and, and come and have a look at what we do there. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of, I guess, a slight perk of the job in that I get to meet some of the people that come visit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that sounds very fun. And then um, also, real quick, I want to hear about the uh, the bottle of port wine that was left. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, Stonehenge has been excavated many, many times. And one of the guys who excavated in the 1800s was uh, a local guy called William Cunnington. And he excavated under a stone, which we now call the Slaughter Stone, even though it was never used for slaughtering anything but anyway it was it's named the slaughter stone and he excavated and basically he left underneath it a bottle of port um in order for the next archaeologist who was going to come along to find it and somebody did so in the 1920s when a chap called Hawley was excavating the site he found this bottle of port um uh, unfortunately apparently the cork had, had decayed so there wasn't any drinkable uh, uh port left in the bottle oh. um but it's quite nice because uh, I mean, archaeologists do tend to do this. They'll leave a coin in the bottom of a trench to show the year that it was dug, or they'll leave kind of a small memento in there so that if somebody does go back, uh, they'll know who it was and what when it, when it was done. But I think I'm not sure I've heard of a bottle of port being left anywhere else. Right, yeah. <laughs> That's so fun. <laughs> I'll do that. Like, we do, we put in some new hardwood floors in our um, well, in my parents' house, and we laid down some newspapers and wrote a note to the next person who ever finds it. Oh, that's good. That's nice. Time capsule. That was fun. (laughs) Man, well, this was so fun, Susan. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing all this information. This is great. That's good. I hope it's prepared you for your trip. You'll you'll enjoy it more knowing more. (laughs) Yeah, no, totally. That's so true where like the more you know about something and appreciate it, the more fun it is to go and visit and really see everything. So, yeah, I'm very, very excited for this now. Cool. Um, So we'll just wrap up here. so where should we, like, if people want to learn more about Stonehenge, where's the best place to send them? So our website is um, English Heritage. So it's www.english-heritage.org.uk. And if you go to that website, there's a big picture of Stonehenge on the front page. Just click on that. And we have lots and lots of information there about um, the history of Stonehenge, where the stones come from, quite a lot of the things we've talked about today in more detail. Um, there's some nice um, interactives there. You can explore what it looks like from inside the stone circle. We've got a visualization of what the sky looks like called Stonehenge skyscapes, all kinds of things. Uh, and that website will also uh, tell you how you can visit Stonehenge, how you can come uh, and, and see it, um, and also how to do the Stone Circle access, which is what you've got. Yes. Yeah. OK, perfect. Well, I'll have a link for everyone to check that out. So thank you. Um, cool. And then, I mean, is there anything else um, you want to kind of share or any kind of misconceptions about uh, Stonehenge that you feel are are misrepresented or anything like that that you want to wrap up with? No, just it wasn't aliens. That's all. Right. <laughs> it wasn't aliens. It wasn't aliens. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Susan. Thanks again for being here. Really appreciate it. And uh, have a good one, all right? Okay, thanks very much. Bye. Well, there you have it. That was episode 76. Thanks for sticking around and listening to the episode in its entirety. I appreciate it. And thank you to Susan Graney for being on and sharing all that info. It was really fun and interesting to learn that, honestly, truly. I'm very excited to go to Stonehenge now and visit it and see it in person uh, and get that inner circle tour access where I get to walk into the stones, which should be pretty cool. Um, I'll be sharing that info, that kind of trip on Instagram on my personal account, um, I'm on Instagram at Trav DeRose, T-R-A-V-D-E-R-O-S-E, if you want to follow along and check it out. Up to you. Um, but that's all I have to say. Really appreciate you being on here and, and enjoying the curiosity podcast. You had to have enjoyed it if you listened for 58 minutes and 26 seconds. And maybe you know somebody else who might enjoy it. And if you do, I'd really, really appreciate it if you shared it, sent it along to them. 
that really helps the show out, spreads the word. Um, send it to your friends, family, teachers, uh, acquaintances, work buddies, whatever you like, really. Um, anybody who may be interested in Stonehead. So that's it. I'm just rambling now. I'm going to stop talking. Thanks again for being here. Find us on curiosityness.com where you can access all our social channels and learn more and join in the context and chat more on the stories. <laughs> all right. I'll see you in episode 77. Bye-bye.